this uh, uh, panel discussion, which is the Q&A session. I think I'll move to the podium uh, so that I'm better able to see the room. Uh, the floor is open. I will identify uh, those who have raised their hands with the <laughs> uh, Yes, I will begin with uh, uh, Professor Mitra. Uh, but uh, let me just say that uh, uh, the rest of you should uh, identify yourself and your affiliation when you ask your questions. I recognize Professor Sukhavan. Thank you, Chairman. Excellent panel. Wonderful papers. What we should do with them, I'll talk about when uh, everything ends and I say a few words. And um, my specific question is to Professor Samantha Parantas. Uh, you have subtly convinced me that we should be investing in Bangladesh. What uh, I'm not so sure about is uh, if that figure of 3 billion that you put on the slide is an aspirational figure or if it bears reality. The point is this. Bangladesh was one of the founders of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. And if I remember correctly, our chairman, uh, Ambassador Chaudhary, at the time a young promising diplomat, was one of the spiritual fathers of the Tonga team. It then went on to become South Asian uh, free trade area, and uh, then it didn't get anywhere. And uh, we are trying through ISAS and Dr. Chaudhary to give a quick start. But when I look at your figure of 3 billion, I, 3 billion customers who you could uh, reach out to, I ask myself, are there no restrictive trade practices? Are there no tariff and non tariff barriers that are hemming in the South Asian market? Um, is Bangladesh going to play with South Asia? Or will Bangladesh get out of South Asia and look beyond South Asia, maybe towards China? Thank you. Okay, uh, is the question directed to Samantha? Yes. Uh, oh, you, you take the first shot, but I'm sure at some point in time you would like to intervene with regard to the tariff and non tariff areas. Samantha, you, you respond first. Thank you for the question, sir. Um, in terms of whether there are whether there are restrictions, yes, so there will obviously be restrictions. When whereas in terms of being at Vida, I see every day how the Vida relevant officials are always putting pressure on the government to improve its relationships with countries uh, surrounding uh, with its neighboring countries, so that they can actually enhance their market access for its investors. But yes, there is an access, there is access to 3 billion people if you do think of it. If you, can, if you can locate your business in Bangladesh, and if you are an export processing, uh, suppose you're an exporting business, so why not go beyond Bangladesh? Why not go there? So there is an opportunity. You don't have to be stuck within the borders. You can go beyond as long as you have all the documentation and paperwork that you need. Um, and obviously, you, your business, it's your business model, it's you also up to you, who do you want to reach out to, so your consumer base. Um, and obviously, Bangladesh does want to look beyond just South Asia or Southeast Asia. They are already, uh, if you look into the RMG sector, they're already major uh, contributors to the US and the EU, so that is obviously beyond uh, South Asia. Um, that, uh, that's all I have to really say about this. Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Mushiram discuss this. Let me try a few of you allow. One is, uh, when you talk about SART failing, uh, you know, there's a story today, and uh, we export duty-free garments to India, and Indian manufacturers have actively paid uh, to their government to withdraw that uh, facility. So, you know, when you talk about South, East, uh, South Asian regional integration, the intra-regional trade is less than 5%. And we have not only lots of NTVs also, but lots of non-tariff barriers as well, hindering our export. So Bangladesh has to move to the next uh, level, and we have to think beyond South Asia, because in spite of the spiritual fathers of SARC standing right there, we've, we've actually become uh, no action talk only. Uh, as far as SARC is concerned. So, uh, seriously, we do not, even as exporters, we do not 
uh, export to almost any of our uh, SARC uh, partners. So, so we went there anyway. Uh, so we, that's why we're talking about a greater integration. And, and I think we have to move beyond Bangladesh. Well, this is, uh, she explains why SARC has become NATO, no action, talk, talk only. Uh, yeah, uh, supplement. Uh, I would not say there are barriers because uh, there are there are taxes uh, and there are regulations. Uh, our highest custom duty is 25 percent at Belden, and the weighted average is 13 point something. It's below uh, is 13.14 or 13.4. Half of roughly what is the nominal uh, protection. Uh, whenever the tax is added, or ideally it has to be applied uniformly to both import and domestic production. So there is no discrimination between import and, uh, and domestic production. Similarly, supplementary duty is applied uniformly to both import and uh, domestic production. For import, there is a slight increase because the rate is applied to duty paid value. So if you pay 20% duty, you actually pay uh, the supplementary duty 20% uh, uh, above the domestic production. There is a slight element of protection there. Uh, There are a few restricted sectors where foreign investment is not permitted, like nuclear power, arms, but these are all non-traded items, not, not the ordinarily traded items. So basically there is no uh, barrier as such which prevent an, uh, uh, an exporter to reach out to Bangladesh market. I guess what ought to be noted is the income level uh, uh, in Bangladesh market. Consumer goods for uh, middle income or low income household consumer goods, that has a uh, big market in Bangladesh. Currently we have also gone into uh, assembly and limited production of household electronic goods. So when she says that you have a large market, uh, you can also say you have a very large niche market which you can enter. Uh, if you are if you are choosing between say USA and Bangladesh, I guess you are not the producer for Bangladesh. But if you are producing for the low income groups in India or uh, some part of Pakistan or certain other parts of Asia, Bangladesh Bangladesh is an attractive destination for your exports. And uh, if you don't believe, you can come with your merchandise, and we'll find a buyer for you. Professor Smithra's merchandise is only intellectual. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, you are, okay, I mean, the point that Rubana was also making is that exports will na naturally choose it, its markets. And if the markets are not confined to the territory of what we call South Asia, the worse for it. So uh, still, uh, it is an idea uh, which is worth pursuing, as you know, and SARC is something that we will still, uh, it's not a dead horse uh, f uh, being flogged, we will still pursue it, and to the best we can, we will try to uh, render it into some kind of an institution which, whereby it will make the people of South Asia identifiable as some kind of a unit of sorts. I have two, uh, two uh, questions uh, here, uh, Dr. Dipinder Singh Ranwa, uh, thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Um, my questions are directed towards uh, Ms. Huck and uh, Ms. Farinath. So thank you for bringing light to the landscape. Um, there's an astonishing statistic that you had uh, quoted. Uh, that was a literacy rate of 70% with female literacy that's still 77%. Um, my first question is, what is it? I mean, I'm sorry, in the development community, it's pretty well known that Bangladesh has been a remarkable success story and primarily due to women being able to break through the shackle boat 
that permeates much of uh, South Asia, with the possible exception of Bhutan and uh, Sri Lanka. Could you talk about the factors that led to these remarkable changes and the, the transformation as well? And um, to what extent has it facilitated women being moving up in the labor force and on, on the ladder? The second question is a more pointed one, and this relates to the genesis of the, uh, uh, the, the, the textile sector. Uh, could you talk specifically about how the realization of the MFA agreement in the early part of the last decade uh, facilitated this, and to what extent public policy may have uh, turned out to be a catalyst for the remarkable growth that we witnessed since? Thank you. It was like this, it was 55%. But anyway, in respect of that, um, how, um, I, I wasn't sure about your question, but um, I think you're referring to how, how this transformation has happened, right? Okay. So female empowerment, when we talk about basically, we primarily refer to female um, empowerment through ready-made garment sector. Over 3 million women are employed there. And uh, you'll find it very strange when you, if you ever visit a factory premise, you'll see during lunch hours, basically there are husbands queuing up uh, to get money from the, from the wives. So that's a very pleasant scenario. But that does not indicate that we have uh, broken the shackles. We're far from it. You know, we, I, I also don't see any light because, you know, this is going to be a sector which is probably not going to be all that thriving in the next 10 years. What will all these women do? Where will the labor force go? And as uh, the Honorable Advisor uh, mentioned that you know, we are moving into other areas and intermediate goods production, even then, where do we really go? Are we equipped for it? When we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, are we literate enough? Are we looking at a jobless growth in the near future? Is, are, are questions that need to be thought about? So. Um, as much as we have challenges, um, we also have to you know, be very bold with our vision. Um, and what, what was the second part, sir? You were talking about MFA? Uh, the MFA and the role of public policy. And, uh... Well, the government has definitely, you know, uh, I think governance is, uh, has been the key factor in bringing um, the stability in the development of women in Bangladesh. Our, our policies are very, very strong. <coughs> And, uh, you know, uh, had the government not been serious uh, about the SDG goals, we would have been far from it. And, and all our human factors are, are you know, we are, we, are, we, are, we are really progressing with that. So it's basically public policy has shaped Bangladesh as a female. Uh, and I hope, you know, in, in terms of inheritance and everything, if we could move forward, it would be, uh, but, uh, but we are also trapped by our own demons. So we need to also take that into consideration. But MFA, yes, I mean, uh, the global scene has, has dominated. Uh, the, the thing that basically brought the revolution in Bangladesh governments was basically EU. Uh, when the quota phase out happened, we were all thinking that you know, Bangladesh's government sector would die and we would be exposed to unlimited uh, um, competition. But then we survived. And with EU relaxing the rules of origin, you know, Earlier it used to be two country, two, two stage. So that happened, you know, when they said no, if it's done in Bangladesh, we will allow the EBA facility, everything but arms. That is when Bangladesh basically started thriving. So 2005, post-2005, Bangladesh garment industry actually saw the ultimate heights. Yeah, that's true. I mean, EBA was absolutely critical, uh, critical to it. But also at one stage, mind you, I mean, uh, there was some structure adjustment globally needed to force these facilities to countries like Bangladesh because time was when it was countries like the Scandinavian countries, Spain, uh, uh, southern United States, Italy were the common producers. Eventually that would be structurally adjusted in order to give us those facilities and then the market access facilities she was talking about we uh, agreed. Yeah. That pretty much sums up uh, uh, what, what we were at, what you asked. Um, yes, the government of Bangladesh has uh, made immense pride in making sure 
this issue was addressed in terms of women empowerment. As you all know, that Bangladesh was a leading example in achieving the Millennium Development Goals, where female literacy, female empowerment was a serious factor. And it, it's not just the government of Bangladesh, it's also the private sector that plays a major role in this because it is the private sector that generates this, these jobs for women so that they can actually work and that's, this, this is where they actually make a statement and this is where they actually make a difference. They will, only through this employment is how you stand out and you have to show that yes, women in this society, in this economy are actually major contributors. Um, and it's an overall change in the mindset, an overall change in the attitudes of people that have been that have happened over the decades because uh, because of the uh, because of the awareness that has been created by the government, because of the facilitation that has been brought up by the private sector, and how people they actually wanted to change. They did not want to be uh, old, backdated. Uh, traditional anymore, they actually wanted to bring all the positive changes and that's all that happened, it's just a shift in time. Okay, uh, honorable advisor, I may add to that, uh, not that I will add to the knowledge or explanation, but because of my age I have collected more tasks and whenever there is an opportunity, kind of blow out that task, I try to take this opportunity. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Chaudhary said, there was a relocation of industries from Taiwan and some other countries where wages had gone up. Bangladesh was attractive for its low wage. <coughs> the second element in that was, uh, 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 I mean, was uh, when the public policy came in, uh, we were then also short of foreign currency reserve and didn't have enough money to import the input. The, uh, the, the, those who set up the, the RAP initially in Bangladesh, they introduced something called back-to-back -back AC. So the importer also would lend you in advance uh, or to facilitate your procurement of the input which you use for your garments. Uh, the Bangladesh Bank accepted that and that facilitated import of the input. The, the uh, other element was uh, uh, how to, uh, I mean, that does explain the, the preponderance of women, but uh, that women will flock into industries were predicted sometimes in the late thirties or forties by an economist who later on got Nobel Prize also. His prediction was, as industries expand, there will be an increased demand for labor. And you would look for labor with low wages. I hope they will, they will uh, forgive me. Women could offer this low wage entry into the labor market. Also, women represented at least at that stage, maybe even now, a low level of unionization. So they were attractive for new entrepreneurs. Uh, bonded uh, facility was another. Uh, fabrics was very, uh, the, the, the custom duty was priority. But the uh, garments industry were given bonded facilities so they could import without paying duty. So upfront cost was uh, reduced. Uh, World Bank prepared a story of Bangladesh RNG. That was more about a particular factory which was pioneer, Desh Garments. That, that gives the story of how Desh Garment uh, trained people and they said that the graduates of Desh Garment subsequently set up their own industries. Uh, Dr. Hafez Siddiqui, who was Vice Chancellor of uh, North South, he wrote a book on uh, RNG in the early 90s. He showed some number that our close competitors, India, Pakistan, they provide a subsidy at different levels amounting to about 18%. In the export market, we sold, we were, uh, we sold, I mean, our prices were about 3% higher than those countries. 
which would mean that if you subtract the subsidy that we got in other countries, we were much more efficient. That efficiency was the very important factor. And I guess nowadays, the government factory also is introducing uh, uh, capital machinery, as she said, the jobless growth. But that takes you into another area, equity, participation, employment, and so on. But inherently, the government industry remains efficient. That's why you could cope it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last two questions. Uh, I have to say here, yeah, uh, uh, you, and then Yan Mishra. Uh, so we we'll wrap it up. We we'll take the two, pers uh, two questions together, and then we'll react to the yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is Omkar's question. That's in fact the new yes. And student of Dr. Mishra Raman. This I said because. I had the pleasure to serve in Bangladesh while I was in the Asian Development Bank for three years. So I had remained, I continue to remain a great admirer of Bangladesh. I have seen some of the things that being talked about here from food, famine to food self sufficiency. What a great transformation that was. From LBC, now we have IC, Millennium Country. From basket case to showcase, I think it's about time to really invite Dr. Kissinger back for the race. And you know, I was just talking, and Dr. Mishraman has been an economic architect during my, when I was there, and he continues to be now as an advisor and prime minister as cabinet ranking. <coughs> you know, during the coffee break, but we have to ask you a little bit quickly the question. Yes, I was. No, but I couldn't sleep inside and talk extra from my bread for yeah. three years here. Yeah. And he was saying that the biggest thing in Bangladesh is the mindset, the change in people's mindset. To me, that's a fantastic achievement. Not tangible, but most difficult. From keep up attitude to can do attitude. That to me is a great accomplishment. Now my question Dr. Bashir Khan, more to learn than from any other angles. For instance, we talked about particularly this uh, democratic dividend. I am very concerned that democratic dividend could be democratic helping for the simple reason that each month there are 128,000 young, new young people who are seeking jobs, being added to youth, job and labor force. Now, the policy environment is for the center something. Now, that continues to be on foreign employment opportunities. At a time like this, when we always talk about the growing population, the fourth industrial revolution, the move from tangible economy to non tangible economy, the knowledge economy, the move of uh, capitalism without capital. At a time like this, this labor force, you know, how do we make them? Job providers rather than job seekers or the independents like Madame Rubana was talking about. Or yes, this could be the headwind rather than dividend. Like I'm sure the government may have something, you know, uh, the policy here. I just want to learn from it. And we talked about the EU's very generous support or generous attitude. How long can this be depended on? You know, internationally, there is a, you know, within Asia, there is a tremendous shift, and the statistical proof by HG's regular uh, statistics, the move from each of the major Asian countries increasing and ex uh, their imports as well as export among Asian countries, very visible shift from their trade, the traditional trade to Europe or America, except Bangladesh. That I was surprised that Bangladesh export to EU, particularly Europe, continues to increase. I have a figure here, but I don't mind the figure. Now, to me, I think Bangladesh and Vietnam are the only two major Asian economies that has that continued dependence on EU. How long, how far, how much reliability is there? Okay. Now, of course, the policy was I see that the government is trying to shift from other major Asian countries, but with you know, the European markets are quite a great tragedy and irony that India is seeking negotiation with ASEAN on RCEP that demands much more open economy. And within SAR, I see such a very sad story here. Okay. That's a very beautiful question. Now, how do we address that? And finally, 
five years ago, get back now. The FDI per day used to be two billion, that's one percent of GDP. In spite of where and why do you invest in Bangladesh? If you ask me, I said, where else? If not in Bangladesh. When, if not now. But still, with all these things being done, but why are you doing business, running this still continues to be bottom ten percent? FDI, two billion dollars, one percent of GDP. Okay, so so and the NPR. Okay, all right, all right. So this is more to learn from Dr. Mushir. Very much, please. You learn some more. Uh, incidentally, you mentioned Vietnam and Bangladesh. Uh, as we speak this evening, the president of Vietnam is in Bangladesh, and he's talking, I think, to the, uh, to the Prime Minister, Bangladesh Prime Minister right now. Uh, Anish Mishra. Okay, yes, my name is uh, Anish Mishra. Okay, firstly, I'd like to thank the, the panelists for the excellent presentation. I think all of you have made your country very proud, proud with this presentation. Okay, my, my question is on uh, on human rights uh, and the GSP class. Since <coughs> since the 2000, 2013 collapse of Rana Rana Plaza, Bangladesh has come under the spotlight for 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 labor conditions and the the very poor factory conditions in the garment industry. And uh, okay, when it comes to the European Union, we are the everything but arms. But recently, the United United States have rejected Bangladesh on a general scheme of preference. And I think a country like Bangladesh cannot afford to pretend that we have not benefited from GSP Plus because you have benefited from GSP Plus, and you should be proud that the privilege was given to you, and you have and you have made uh, progress with that. So uh, I, and I just want to know, no, because some of the government industries have very powerful positions in the government. So how do you think that the Bangladeshi government is able to control the capitalists in Bangladesh, particularly related to the labor, to the tough labor conditions? And I just want to say that this is actually very important for, for your country because in the 21st century, when people are more conscious about um, about about. Uh, very, very trained and ethical. And it's when you go to the shop, you find a garment from Bangladesh, you, you pick it up, you always have uh, a choice. Number one, you want to buy it because you want to support the whole country, but on the other hand, are you supporting capitalists who actually treat workers like slaves? So this is a, 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 a moral dilemma that people face. I myself face a dilemma when I pick up something from Bangladesh. Whether do I want to support the whole country or capitalists who treat people like slaves? Okay, and um, my, 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 my second point that I want to make is that Bangladesh, Bangladesh, the, since the, 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 the conditions they face, they have come to independence. I mean, one reason why I admire Bangladesh is that we are the only South Asian country that spilled the blood, fought a war, a war of liberation to get your independence. Unlike India and Pakistan, who actually sent our viceroy off on, 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 on escorted horses and, 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 and carriages. You, you spilled the blood, paid the price of independence. And the thing is that we have, we have, Bangladesh has a lot to teach the world. And I just want to know for example, for Cosmo uh, since it's in a Bangladeshi think tank, what do you think you can do to actually go to sub Sub-Saharan sub Africa to teach to teach the, the countries there to progress like like where even in South Asia you have lots you have you have a lot to, to, to teach the world. And uh, as I mentioned on the on GSP plus, there's one thing about Bangladesh which I see which will happen in the next five to ten years. This Bangladesh will progress, it will become a middle income country, but it will pretend to be a LDC to get preferential market access. Um, um, preferential market access. Um, so the thing I want to know is that, well, what, what I say, do, do you think that, that this may be right, that Bangladesh can progress, but it will pretend to be a poor country? Thank you. Are you pretending to be poor? Come on, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to dispel some of your you know, assumptions. Number one, post-2013, Bangladesh has addressed issues of compliance. And the highest number of factories, green factories, in the world actually happen to be in Bangladesh. That's one. Two, Bangladesh, with Accord and Alliance, and with the help of the government, we have almost achieved a position where we are positioned to be the most responsible apparel supplying hub for the world. So we have the maximum number of compliant factories right now. So that is history for us. And uh, you should actually come and take a look at uh, the Bangladeshi factories. 
we are probably far better than many other in the world currently. And nobody talks of China when there are 144,000 industrial deaths a year. Everybody just keeps on talking about Bangladesh. Nobody's talking about Myanmar where the EU is actually positioned uh, to do a smart project where they want to take more from Myanmar but cannot right now because of the genocide. So you see, Bangladesh has been in the spotlight only because of Rana Plaza and a couple of other industrial accidents. But we have been unfortunate enough. But we have addressed that as well. And as far as wages go, I mean, we are competitive. But at the same time, there is, a, there is an immense pressure on many of our, many of the suppliers to now cater to fair wage. And you know, in my factories, we are anyway to make fair wage and not minimum wage. So I, I don't think you know, Bangladesh is also far from that, and our minimum wage is also being now revised. So in spite of anything and everything, Bangladesh will continue to be most competitive, not only because of wage, but also because of our excellent factory conditions and the way we are looking at it. And when I made my appeal today, I appeal with my heart and not with my head. It's not only about profits. Today, the business and the entrepreneurs also want to do good, look good, and feel good. It's all about a combination of all. So, you know, we are moving ahead with head and heart both. So there's no reason to assume that Bangladesh will lose out. And as far as GSP Plus is concerned, I mean, the whole process is going to take up to 2028 for Bangladesh to ultimately face the challenge. By then, we will not have to pretend. And Bangladesh will never pretend. We are happy to be uh, strong, and we would want to negotiate from our position of strength and not of weakness. Thank you. Here, here. If I do address a number of questions by your st student, yes. student. But the problem with being a student is, as all of us know, that yes. Aristotle was a student of Plato, but he famously said, "Amicus Plato, like Magis said, Magis Amica Veritas." Dear is Plato. But dear still is the truth. So, would you like to hear the truth? I think uh, Omkar Sestra's questions were asked. Uh, I think it addressed quite a lot of things. And uh, let me try to respond to, uh, to one or two points that he made. Uh, a demographic dividend, the uh, so most of the literature on demographic development is recognized that uh, it's a short-lived one and even if nothing else happens on me, there are more people to work. Each of them produce something. So in terms of GDP growth, it adds to GDP growth. It does not necessarily mean that distribution is equitable. There may be people who do not get jobs, the number of people unemployed may increase. That is why the government policy and intervention are necessary in order to create jobs, not only in a particular sector, but across sectors. And I should say that the government uh, of Bangladesh is concerned about it, and uh, some of the major programs are uh, rural infrastructure and the transformative infrastructure that uh, many of us, including myself, refer to. Uh, this demographic dividend for us is inevitable, it is there. So we cannot say that we will not have the dividend. The choice for us is to how to get the best, make the best use of the dividend, which is in employment, absorbing them in wealth. Uh, I guess your another concern was uh, uh, with this artificial intelligence related more mechanization, more efficiency, etc. Uh, if, I mean, the, the, the capital equipment that enhances efficiency, and I guess in a very simple economic terms, if the production moves outward, uh, then the employment also uh, goes with that. Now, because of the artificial intelligence, it is so noble that we cannot say exactly how it will work out. But there are some, some, of, of some uh, in textile industry abroad, they have said that artificial intelligence has not yet been created in such a manner that they can address the soft 
labor input. Textile and garments require a lot of soft labor. And, and here, some of it may be standardized, but not all of it can be standardized. I do not think that we can have an artificial, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, equipment which can stitch the buttons. So there are some elements for which you need human labor. So we do export to European Union and also to USA. Those are our uh, important markets. I guess among the reasons are we could export to, we could sell to countries around us. But most of the countries had very had restricted trade regime. So we went to countries which were open and more accessible. But as you yourself say, the mindset, uh, at some point of time, I guess we recognize that challenges will be there. The conditions will not be always conducive to us. Can we respond to that challenge? So this, this spirit of responding to the challenge is perhaps a motivating factor for whatever we have achieved. And unless the, the people collectively have this spirit of responding to challenge, it is very difficult to get anything done. It is something that cannot be measured or identified. But when you see its results, you recognize that something has happened. I guess that is one of the many major explanation of why we succeed and why you also fail in some areas. And thank you for your very comprehensive question. <clears throat> the questions were very brilliantly answered by uh, both Rubana and uh, Dr. Mishirama. But having said that, I personally feel that the demographic dividend would be fully utilized or the dividend would be 100% absorbed because of the amount of infrastructure that is being built in Bangladesh, both in terms of social infrastructure as well as physical infrastructure. Um, as some of, some, some of the speakers have pointed out, that the social infrastructures are so good that we are having less mortality, education, women's education, empowerment of, across the board. As Rumana had earlier mentioned, 50% of the workforce are from women and hopefully this will become equal in both sides. The unemployment rate in Bangladesh is decreasing. It's not increasing, it's decreasing at a faster pace than anywhere else. So. I, I continue to see a very rosy picture. We continue to be able to provide electricity. We continue to be able to provide exports and imports, enhanced capacities in the ports, as well as this tremendous uh, removal of the digital divide that we had in the world, uh, with the 4G being introduced only a couple of weeks back. Uh, I personally feel that it's the golden time. Thank you. OK, thank you. Now I begin the wrap-up process and uh, I'll start by inviting all of you to uh, pay full attention for the next 10 minutes to hear and listen to Professor Subrata Mitra. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Your Excellencies, our honored guests from Bangladesh, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a long day, a challenging day, and a very rewarding day for putting together an enterprise like this. While well, it's a lot of organization, it's my opportunity now as Director ISAS to thank a few people who have made this possible and then do something typically, typically Singaporean to talk about the takeaways from uh, this uh, meeting. The idea of this conference emerged during a visit Dr. Chaudhary had organized and with our chairman, Ambassador Sri Gopinath Pillai. And uh, I've seen how tirelessly you have worked with uh, our partner for this occasion, Dr. Nathan Lakhan, to conceptualize it and bring from Bangladesh the kind of people we don't normally see in our events. 
and extract from them the kind of paper uh, together you have extracted. All of us owe you and in Atula a round of applause and very, very A special feature of this event is the contribution you have made, not only to your intellectual and artistic uh, endeavors, but through cash. It's not often that ISIS events get this kind of sumptuous support from Bangladesh. And that, as a fellow Bengali, I acknowledge with great pride and my career joy. The event is a joint event, so applauses are to be shared jointly. Now for some takeaways. Why do we do things like this? As all of you know, Singapore is a knowledge economy, and as a think tank, it's our job to do the thinking for those who have neither the time and possibly not the competence to think about such complex issues as this panel has shown us. But having done that, it's not shoot and scoot. The job of the think tank is to organize events like this, get primary knowledge from all over the world in our field, harvest it, label it, and send it off. The labeling, of course, in this case would be Cosmos ISIS or ISIS Cosmos, but we have to publish. This is what I was hinting at earlier. So, Dr. Chaudhary, your work is not done yet. We have five excellent potential papers here, and I look forward to putting them on the shelf as working papers so that this valuable knowledge would be available to the stakeholders for quite some time to come. In any case, it's a customary practice for ISAS within a week or so of the event to put the summary of the findings and uh, a brief description of the speakers so that the knowledge would be in the public sphere. The second takeaway is an excellent proposal that emerged from Dr. Rubanabhat. And when I was listening to you, um, about the idea of an Asian Institute of Human Entrepreneurship, it really moved me, and you have noticed, all of you have noticed, when you talked about how to put together the heart and the head, you got a round of applause, I applauded it enthusiastically. Because it's not just how far one got, but how far one traveled to get there is what matters. By both criteria, what Bangladeshi women have shown us is a model for all of us in South Asia. In Bangladesh, I've spoken to not just garment workers, but women workers, and I've understood how they do their own banking, how the money goes not only to the hands of women, but beyond the women to the family, and how they manage their cash. This I just came to India much later, with Transistor Group, with Chandan Rosna, other card and uh, dark bank accounts. Bangladesh women have shown that already. So this animal entrepreneurial spirit, which Dr. Chaudhary was talking about, is uh, to be showcased, and this knowledge is to be institutionalized and passed on globally to women everywhere. Because at the end of the day, when the money goes to the man's hand, it finds its way to the auction, to the nearest alcohol shop. Women turn it into food. Women turn it into investment. Women turn it into future human capital. So that's an excellent idea, except that ISIS is not the business of setting up institutes. We are an institute ourselves. But if you set this up, or if this audience remembers it and it goes to Singapore collective memory, who knows what else might happen? And we are talking about Singapore here, which is a, a very important part of South Asia, except that it's not in South Asia. And if Singapore does it, all South Asian countries can certainly benefit. And why visit to South Asia? You are thinking globally, aren't you? So that is for me a very important takeaway from here. Yet another takeaway was hinted at by our chairman, Ambassador Sri Gopinath who is not here at the moment, but the chairman has spoken and the director has noticed. You know, we are now going to plan on the next workshop, which will be customized so that we can have a full 
day workshop and have it not just on investment and uh, on uh, the economy, but we have a full range. After all, Bangladesh has also shown us how identity can take its territorial shape and a secular shape based on language. After all, it's the Bhasha Andalun with Bangladesh started. And that is something that one can showcase in terms of the workshop. And the uh, workshop, which can then go towards a book where we can assess from Singapore the enormous achievements of Bangladesh and in a comparative manner pass it on to those who are still struggling in Latin America, Africa, other parts of Asia. And this knowledge can then be a contribution of Cosmos and Isa, a Bangladeshi gift to all of us. These then are some of the concrete takeaways. My, I come now to my second takeaway. You know, when we talked about Bangladesh as a bridge, I was thinking of Bangladesh as a bridge power for the whole of Asia. The way Sri Lanka has been doing for a long time, bridging China and India, I was thinking about now the new rival, because Bangladesh is much better placed in terms of in terms of being a central land border connecting India, connecting uh, Southeast Asia, connecting the landlocked northeast of India, which now is no longer landlocked, and moving beyond that to East Asia. Bangladesh is probably the best place today to bring all of Asia together and India could use that help because India stayed away from the BRI for very Indian reasons but there's no reason for India not to benefit from the benefits of trade and the BRI and I think we have a job to do there in terms of collaborating with ISAS and Dr. Chaudhary, our principal research fellow and take that idea even further. My third takeaway is very, very personal. I'll allow myself to share it. 1971, at the time of the Liberals Award, I was a student in Delhi. I just moved from Delhi University to Jawaharlal Nehru University, and we were raising bits of funds to host Bangladeshi intellectuals in Delhi, take them around, show them, and connect them, and learn from, from them, and to show our solidarity. Then comes the Russian Sheikh Mujibur Rahman goes home, and we thought that would be the beginning of a great long story until 1975, until the massacre, and then comes this damning statement from Kissinger Bangladesh has a basket case which will be flushed out to the Bay of Bengal. Forgotten are the telegrams, forgotten are the sacrifices, and then comes a very challenging period. My third point is a visit to the Bangladesh Academy for um, Rural Development and that is where I saw garden programs, that is where I had a personal experience of the considerable achievements of Bangladesh. I mean, not just in trade, in feeding its own people, in making great breakthroughs in textile, but in public service delivery. Because I was at the time working on uh, something which is uh, an effort to human dignity, op open dedication. Bangladesh has brought it down under 5,000, and in India, to my great horror, it is still 55,000. Now, how did Bangladesh achieve it? How did Bangladesh achieve this excellent innovation in area of governance? How did Bangladesh make up for those two million elites who were wiped out? And it all happened from below. And today, when I see Bangladesh proudly showcased in Singapore and with the help of Bangladeshi entrepreneurship, it warms my heart as a political scientist, as a South Asian, as a nation, and as a Bengali. So I'll end by saying, enjoy that. Thank you all.
Thank you very much, Professor Mitra, and thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, and our distinguished panelists. Now, before we move towards the end of our event, I would like to invite on stage once again Mr. Khan to present tokens of appreciation to our distinguished panelists. Mr. Khan, please. Now, it's a very, very happy day for me. Um, as I said in the beginning, it's a joint venture between ISIS and Cosmos Foundation. And, um, and I see so much of positive energy in this room. Um, uh, I love my country, and, and I think we are very fortunate that we are able to host this event just prior to the imminent visit of our Prime Minister. And as Dr. Winter said that we are going to prepare a summary, and I'm sure that it will reach the Honorable Prime Minister before her visit, so she can understand what has been going on in this little room. I think lots of magic, and I see such a stimulating session. Uh, and I thank once again Dr. Fritikachokri for taking this initiative to, to stage this. We had many challenges, but finally we overcome it. Uh, we just have a few mementos for this distinguished panelist. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, ISAS and Cosmos Foundation, we'd like to hand over those mementos to the panelists. Mr. Mashur Rahman, Mr. Mohammed Abdul Amin, Mr. Mohammed Khan, Ms. Samantha Farnas, and Ms. Urbana Haq. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the ISIS Cosmos Foundation panel discussion has come to an end. We thank you very much for your kind participation, and we would like to invite you to a cocktail reception outside. Thank you.